Can you hear me? Uh, okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thanks for coming. So uh, I'm Gilberto Bertin. I'm a system engineer at Cloudflare, and today I will talk about our plans to integrate XTP into our DDoS mitigation pipeline. So let's get started by introducing what is Cloudflare. Cloudflare is a security and performance company which provides, among other things, a reverse proxy CDN service. So when a site is on Cloudflare, uh, our edge servers will sit in front of the site origin servers. And this means that all the traffic for the site will go first through our network and will then uh, selectively proxy it back to the origin servers. In this way, we can provide different services such as caching or content optimization, but uh, most importantly for the sake of this talk, we can filter on our edge uh, all the malicious traffic that is targeting the origin servers of the site behind Cloudflare. So um, to, uh, to give you some numbers, Cloudflare has about uh, 6 million uh, customers and about 100 points of presence. And every day we have to uh, handle hundreds of different DDoS attacks targeting many web properties. And they are usually ranging between 50 and 150 packets per second, but we recorded peaks of 500 packets per second attacks. So uh, in the last three years, we have been developing a system called Gatebot. Uh, Gatebot is an automatic DDoS mitigation system and is able to automatically uh, detect and mitigate different kinds of DDoS attacks. And it works by constantly analyzing the traffic that is flowing through our network. So this is an overview of the Gatebot architecture. And Gatebot can be broken down into four main phases. The first phase is traffic collection. So the first thing we do is collect traffic samples on every single server on our network. The second phase is aggregating all the samples uh, in a central location to actually detect the attack traffic that is happening on our network. The third phase is reacting, which means uh, given a list of description of the attacks, we want to produce a series of mitigation rules. And the third phase is, of course, uh, filtering the traffic on the edge servers. And there are two important things to notice here. The first one is that we don't rely on scrubbing centers where the traffic is for water to be uh, filtered, but we rather just filter all the traffic on the edge servers. And the second thing is that we are currently uh, heavy users of classic BPF bytecode for, to express the, the mitigation logic. So let's get started from traffic sampling. Uh, the important thing to notice here is that to detect big DDoS attacks, there is no need to analyze the entire traffic flowing through our network. It will be impractical and a waste of resources. In fact, only a small portion of the traffic uh, is more than sufficient to detect uh, big DDoS attacks of millions of packets per second. And the traffic samples are corrected directly on the edge servers. Uh, we use a combination of IP tables and a, a flock target and a user space program, which basically takes, uh, which gets all the samples from IP tables and forward them as S-flow UDP packets to a central location where they will be analyzed further. Uh, the second phase is attack detection, but first we should define what is an attack. Uh, we can broadly define an attack as a big um, spike of traffic targeting a specific IP or subnet and port. And in this way, it's easy to reason about attacks targeting a specific service. This is a typical day at Cloudflare, where the yellow line represents the baseline or logic traffic, while the green line represents the malicious traffic that was detected by Gatebot. Um, so for what concerns the traffic analysis and aggregation, we first try to aggregate the traffic into macro categories. So for example, the TCP SIM packets are treated separately from TCP ACK packets and from UDP DNS packets. On top of that, we apply uh, other aggregation based on the destination net and port. And finally, on top of that, we apply other um, aggregation based on known attack vectors and other heuristics. And uh, this is a simplified output of this phase. For example, Gatebot may have detected that there are a couple of uh, DNS flute targeting a couple of named servers and the attacker is trying to 
perform what we call a random prefix attack. So basically, the attacker is just sending random queries for the domain example.xyz and is trying to exhaust the CPU of the, of the server. Uh, the next phase is reaction. So the first thing we do is applying a, sim a simple packets per second thresholding because for small attacks there is no need to uh, mitigate them. We can just let the traffic uh, flow through. And then other factors such as the SLA of the client are taken into account to uh, determine the mitigation parameters. And finally, the attack description is turned into uh, BPF, which will then be run on the edge servers. Uh, to do this, we use a set of utilities called BPF tools. They basically take a description of the, path of the attack that you want to match and generate classic BPF bytecode. For example, here we are generating a BPF bytecode to match a specific payload in the NS packets, and in this case, we are matching all the queries for star.example.yyxyz. Uh, the next phase is to push mitigations back to the edge servers. And we, to do this, we use a distributed key value database, which allows us to push in, in a short time uh, the mitigations back to our fleet of machines. And then in the, um, on every server, there is a daemon listening for uh, updates on this key value store. And this daemon is in charge of actually applying the, the mitigations. And to do this, we use a couple of tools, IP tables and uh, user space program to where we offload network traffic. So let's start from IP tables. Uh, IP tables initially was the only tool we were relying on to filter uh, malicious traffic. And it was great because we could use the usual IP table syntax to express uh, all the mitigation logic, and where IP tables was not expressive enough, we would just load with the XT BPF module uh, some BPF bytecode. So this was great to use, but unfortunately, soon we started experiencing performance issues with IP tables, because in case of big attacks, uh, our servers were basically just processing and filtering network packets, and the actual applications were just starving of CPUs. Uh, so we had to move to a user space offload solution. Uh, this is based on the SolarFlare EFEI API. And using this uh, solution, we can just offload to user space uh, the network traffic before the traffic hit the Linux network stack and net filter. And then in user space, we can just run uh, BPF, the same BPF that we will run with IP tables, and just filter uh, the traffic. And this works well because this is an order of magnitude faster than IP tables. But this is still not optimal because there are a couple of uh, issues with that. First thing, this solution requires one or more CPUs to be completely dedicated for this task because uh, what we do is we perform busy polling on the uh, network card dev and queue because we want to minimize the latency, of course. And the second thing is that reinjecting packets back into the network stack from user space is expensive. So for certain kind of attacks, we may end up uploading a lot of legit traffic to user space, which has then to be reinjected back to the network stack. And this may be uh, expensive. And this is where XTP comes into play, because with this XTP, we would have a single unified solution to filter traffic. We would be able to move away the filtering logic from IP tables, and of course, there will be no need to use a, a filtering solution based on user space offload. So uh, where does XTP fit in our system? Uh, the first piece that needs to be changed is the reaction phase, because instead of outputting just a classic BPF for a partial part of a filtering rule, uh, what we want to do is get the list of all the attacks and generate a single XTP program that will match all the attacks. And after that, we could just compile it to eBPF and use the same uh, key value database store that we are currently using and just distribute the bytecode to our fleet of machines. Um, so on the, on the edge, on our edge servers, there will be then uh, an XTP daemon, user space daemon, which would listen for updates on the key value store and would just 
be in charge of deploying the new XDP programs on the NIC driver and keep track of the uh, packets that were dropped by using eBPF maps. So this is an example of a simple XTP program that will be auto-generated. So uh, it's just a list of simple if statements where every statement represents a single rule. So the program will just go through all the rules and try to, if any of the rules is a match, this means that uh, the packet is, should be dropped. And so we just return XTP uh, drop. Otherwise, after going through all the rules, and if known is a match, we just uh, return XTP pass, and the packet is accepted. So how does a specific rule looks like? And again, a specific rule would be composed of a list of a simple list of if statements, where every statement represents a condition that the packet must meet uh, to be uh, matched by the rule. So if any of the condition is not a match, uh, the packet is not a match for the rule, and so we go on with the next rule. Uh, otherwise, if the packet is actually a match for the rule, two more actions are needed, and the actions are accounting and trying to pick the packet for traffic to be sampled. So uh, accounting is easy because we can just keep an eBPF map shared with a user space program where the uh, the key is the attack ID, while the value is just the number of packets that were dropped by um, that were dropped by the rule. So this is fairly easy. Uh, for what sorry, for what concerns um, sampling packet, we are not yet sure about the solution to adopt. And in fact, here it's just commented out, and the filtering function is just ignoring this for the moment. But I will come back to this later. So uh, let's see a practical example of an auto-generated rule. But before doing that, let me first introduce uh, POF. So POF is a tool to passively analyze and categorize network traffic. And one of the features that we like the most from POF is the extremely concise syntax that POF uses to uh, serialize a TCP SIM packet. We call this a signature, and basically it's just a uh, short description of all the meaningful fields of a TCP SIM packet. For example, here we can see a signature, which tells us a lot, because we know it's an IPv4 packet, we know the initial TTL is 64, uh, we know that there are no IP options, uh, the MSS is not fixed, but the window size is 10 times the MSS, and the window scale is 6. Then we have the layout of the TCP options, a couple of quirks, such as uh, the IP ID is not zero, and we know that the packet is not carrying any payload. So currently, our BPF tools uh, package has already support for POF. So we can uh, run the tool, pass a POF signature, and we will get as output uh, the BPF bytecode to match a specific uh, packet that uh, matches the POF signatures. And this, uh, this uh, is done by just building a TCP dump filter first, which is then converted to a uh, classic BPF. And the output is the following. Uh, moving to eBPF and XTP uh, will be bring many improvements, because we can uh, just emit C code, which will be uh, optimized by CLANG. And there will be no longer the 64 instruction limitation, uh, which can be hit if we are dealing with particularly complex POF signatures with classic BPF. And finally, it's easy to combine multiple POF function together, because uh, a matching POF function is just a C function from a XTP context to an XTP action. Uh, so let's see uh, an example of an auto-generated uh, POF source. Uh, in this, this is an early implementation of a POF to eBPF compiler, and we have the usual packet boundary checks before accessing uh, any data from XDP. We access the Ethernet header, and then we can move on with the AP header. So again, boundary checks, and then we can match all the fields that are uh, specified in the, in the POF signatures. For example, IP version, initial TTL, uh, and other quirks of the packet. And then we, could, we can move on and do the same for the TCP header and the TCP options. We can check the, 
that the TCP layout is exactly the same specified on the buff signature. And this is just a simple C program which can be generated automatically by a script and then can be multiple of these programs can be just put together into a single XTP uh, C program and run on our edge. So uh, issues we found while testing XTP. This is not really an issue, it's just like a thing because XTP is a new technology, but XTP requires a new kernel, at least 4.8, but at Cloudflare we are trying to follow the long-term support release, so we would need to run at least Linux 4.9. And the second problem is that there is no driver support for our network cards at the moment. As of Linux 4.10, only Mellanox and Coologic uh, network cards are supported. So again, this is not a real issue, it's just something that it's slowing down the adoption. And the second bigger issue is sampling packet. Because, uh, as I said, uh, we sampled packets on the edge. So if we just drop the packets with XDP drop, we would lose visibility into uh, the traffic that is, going to be, that is being mitigated by XDP. So we need a way to uh, sample, uh, to, to mark a packet that is going to be dropped in a way that the packet can be then matched by IP tables and an NF log target and just sent back to the same user space program we are currently using to uh, format all the packets sample in a SFLOW UDP format and send to a central location. So there are two free ways of doing this. Uh, the first one would be to change a field of the packet, but uh, of course this would, be, would mean uh, trading off some information for the possibility to sample packets. Uh, the second option is to add a VLAN tag to, to a packet, and in this way we could just match the VLAN tag on IP tables without uh, discarding any information from the packet. But this has uh, downsides as well, because it will mean that we need to shift the whole packet content of 8 bytes, and depending on the sampling rate, uh, this could have performance uh, implications. And the first thing, as Jasper suggested on the XTP documentation, would be to introduce a new target, for example, uh, XTP dump, which would allow to move the packet that is going to be dropped to an AF socket. Uh, socket. Um, so currently, yeah, we would probably just add a VLAN tag and So you basically want an SKB mark value? I'm sorry? Could you use an SKB mark value? Uh, if I gave you the, the, you should be able to set the SKB mark and then analyze the packet based upon that value later on, right? Yes. Why can't you do that now? I mean, now XCP has not access to the SKB. Right, 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 okay, that, that's right. So what I'm, what I'm suggesting is we could add a field to the metadata. Yes. And then, that will if be we, and that mark value gets propagated into the SKB when we that build That will it. be, yeah. With that picture that problem. That will be the, the easiest way to just mark a packet, and then we can just. Yeah. I could definitely envision a lot of people wanting to do the same exact thing, so that's a pretty reasonable request for interface, so we might do that for you. Do, doesn't the fill already exist? Like the TC offload guys already uh, do SKB mark in the metadata. They, they mark the, they pass some metadata which implements SKB mark to the kernel. Right, but XP, XDP doesn't have the SKB, so you can't execute the instructions that change the mark. Well, you could use the same field on the, on the, on the DMA metadata, no? Mm. The I'd have to look, look at, at that. I'm not so sure. All right. Somebody else was raising their hand. Okay. Yeah. Um, questions are supposed to come at the end, people. But you, you can. <laughs> yeah. Hi. Um, so uh, my question is, uh, don't you think you would have saved a bit of engineering effort if you would have keep using not IP tables because it's going to be hard to be jitted, but if we, if you use NFT and the JIT happens from the kernel itself, I mean in terms of integrating all this into your existing infrastructure instead of having this full migration? Uh, we we did not think about that because uh, I mean the moment we had uh, a possible solution would be to use 
NFT and maybe the eBPF because uh, we saw that uh, with Linux 4.10, IP tables got the eBPF uh, module, sub got support for eBPF. So we could probably run eBPF with NFT at a lower layer, but we don't know, we don't have benchmarks about that. So it's something we should probably try, yes, but uh, we didn't think about that. Yet. Okay, thank you. Uh, I was just responding to what Jamal was saying. Yeah, most hardware they will actually do the mark uh, in the you know for the DMA, take a software marker, put it, and then it gets copied back, which then gets carried in the SKB, and then it can be extracted and put in the metadata for so XDP. This is in the DMA. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. So yeah, as I said, the, the current solution would be to just change the packet, for example, we can discard the field, and that would be our mark, but if we could just add a mark to the socket buffer, that would be the ideal solution, and we can just match it from IP tables. And, uh, so in conclusion, I'm saying nothing new, but we think XDP is great for two reasons. First, speed, because we are back at dropping packets at the lowest possible layer with basically virtual no cost in dropping them, because the the packet buffers are just recycled. And another important thing is safety because we can run C code in kernel space with uh, guarantees about the program termination and memory safety guarantees. Uh, we don't have yet benchmarks about XDP because uh, there is no support for the drivers for, for our NIC, but we're looking forward to start uh, benchmarking as soon as the drivers will be available. And that's all from me. So questions? Yes. So I, I, first of all, I want to congratulate you on being bold enough to take on a new piece of technology like this and try to use it on such a grand scale. So that's, uh, I think you guys uh, should get a round of applause for taking on XDP like this. Yeah. So one thing we're looking at in, in the future that will be interesting for you guys is uh, I don't want it oh, just to test XDP and see if it works properly. I don't want people to be required to use specific NIC cards or anything like that. So I, at some point, I want to add a generic hook in the code path somewhere so that we can just you can just see if XDP works. It won't be optimal. It won't be the most highest performance solution. But I, I, I know a lot of people are going to run into your situation with the NICs that you have don't support XDP yet. So thanks for bringing that up. That was a really good point to make. So thank you. Thank you. Um, yes. Uh. Okay. Um, did you s uh, you said that the lower uh, place to do the drop is the um, the XDP program? Did you considering do it uh, using the hardware, like using the TCP skip software, or uh, we didn't consider using the hardware because with uh, so currently our uh, servers are using solar flare cards, and so. The, we, we were using previously the FEI API, but XDP looked like the easiest way to uh, achieve better performance for our current setup. Okay, because you can do most of the classification that you're doing in the, in the eBPF program inside the hardware. You can drop the counter, you can drop the packet, you can count it, and you can mark it if you want to do it to get it to user space. It doesn't have unique, that's why. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> well, you, you're using SolarFlare. SolarFlare can't do that. That's Mellanox, Intel. Everybody who's doing TC offload can do this. Naturalnome, then you can run XDP in hardware. And they can do XDP too. Uh, so an, an, an alternative to to, to, to marking the packet, if, 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 if you want to sample it, one idea is also to, to use the, the perf infrastructure to, to use that as we, we, we create a perf sample buffer. I actually think that's Daniel's idea. That, that because in this case, you don't care about the latency of that. So we can delay these sample packets. So we'll use the perf infrastructure to, 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 to put your, 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 your pa the packets you want to sample in, and you, you can have a user space program pulling this out from, from the perf infrastructure and uh, it's, it should be quite fast. Like every 10, cycles, 
but can I access the perf subsystem from an XCP program? Uh, yes, I think so. Daniel is nodding, and I think he added it. So okay. you, you, you can do that. And the, the, the good thing about it is also you, you also get notification if, if, if you try to enqueue something to perf and, and there's not room, you, 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 will, you will get information about that in, in the stream that some packets were, were missed. So you know if, if the user space program got too slow of, of sampling this. Okay. So um, in the examples you showed, it seemed like uh, they were for one uh, DOS signature at a time. I'm wondering if you have multiple cases where there's multiple problems and um, if you're hitting the limit, say uh, the BPF limit I believe is 4K, has that been an issue? Sorry, can you repeat the question? So in, in the examples you showed, um, they were, it seemed like it was one, for one DOS signature at a time, like uh, one domain um, being dos or uh, the SIN attack. And I'm wondering, how do you combine multiple attacks and into a single um, mitigation and whether or not we're hitting the limits of BPF, which I believe is like a 4K instructions, at least an XDP would be? Uh, I thought about that and I don't think we are going to hit the 4K limitations for, for a new BPF program. That seems unlikely. So. Um, do you do you ever poke into the packet, or or most of your BPFs kind of just look at the headers? Uh, where sorry, okay. Uh, the question is: Do you do you ever poke deeper into the packets, or do you do your programs just look at the packet headers? Uh, I'm not following. Do you look into the data? Uh, the yes, we inspect all the the layer for data of a packet. I think we're gonna, we're gonna put Gilberto at the penalty box over here. <laughs> There's a gift for you. Thank you. Thank you. Let's give him a round of applause. Yeah.